Okay. And uh, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so Paul, go ahead and uh, take it away. Sure, yeah. So yeah, um, thanks. Um, I've got a few slides, which I will go ahead and share. Um, it's a new computer, so some of the tech has been a little interesting. Um, and then there it is. Okay, so do you see the uh, just a slide? We are seeing your presentation mode currently. Uh, can never get it right. All right, and better? Yes. All right. All right, and it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you see a slide in advance, uh, no one will die. So, okay, good. Um, right, so yeah, um, thanks, Darcy. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and, you know, I'm Paul Keen, as Eric says, I'm, as of Monday, uh, very literally, I'm three days into a new job. I'm the leadership giving officer, uh, which is to say the development officer for the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Uh, and before that, until Friday, I was a uh, foundation relations officer at MIT. Um, both of these are frontline uh, positions within development uh, at the Institute. And this is to say, uh, I'm a fundraiser, right? I'm the kind of person who is out running around looking for money uh, and having these gift conversations. So what I am hoping to uh, convince you of, uh, and apparently I succeeded with Eric last time, uh, is that uh, development uh, fundraising is in fact a really, really great career uh, and particularly, and I think this is true, a great career for uh, classicists. Um, it's growing um, in all sorts of ways, both in terms of numbers, um, more and more jobs, and in terms of importance. Um, I think last year really highlighted the import importance of fundraising, how to sustain it, how to do it sustainably, uh, and how to build, you know, in particular endowments that can bridge you across some of these, these crisis moments. Um, so I think it's a really good place. Uh, it's a growing field. Uh, we're expecting sort of 40%, uh, or no, sorry, uh, what's the number? 12% uh, growth from the Department of Labor is the estimate. Uh, something like 40% of fundraisers are thinking of getting a new job outside of fundraising. In other words, there are huge numbers of fundraising jobs and low numbers of fundraisers, um, which is really good if you think of the parallel situation in, I don't know, say classics. So uh, I really enjoyed it uh, and um, can talk uh, at great length about it either here or, or individually uh, if, if you guys want to follow up with me later. So um, I thought the plan could be, um, I've hit the slide button too early, is just a little bit about me, um, emphasizing primarily the things that I think helped me make this jump into development, uh, talk a little bit about what development is, uh, then we can take a break from me talking, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, how you guys are thinking about uh, development, maybe sometimes you've made some asks for things. Uh, and then once we come back after that, talk about other ways forward in development. Uh, there's something for everybody. And then we'll end with sort of why and how. Uh, in other words, why development, why it's so good, uh, why it is such a good place, and then how to make that sort of a jump. So um, I suppose I've already hit the button. So if you're looking at this, um, this is basically a sort of compressed version of my now resume. Uh, and so, you know, I started at the University of Chicago. Uh, I do have a PhD in classics from there. Uh, I am, was, uh, pick your tense, uh, Greek historian um, and worked in Cyprus. Uh, while I was in grad school, I did sort of the really just the usual array of things, nothing tremendously uh, special there. Uh, I had some university fellowships, uh, in other words, things I applied for and got. Uh, I wrote some things, um, you know, a handful of publications. I was at the American School for a year, um, an application that I got, right? Uh, and then had a Fulbright to Cyprus where I did my dissertation research. Um, so following Chicago, uh, I got really lucky, uh, extremely lucky, frankly. I had literally just given up on the classics job market and then got this job, uh, was posted, and then I ended up getting it over at Valparaiso University over in Indiana. Uh, Valpo was a great job. Um, there I came in, it was sort of a two-person department, um, and the goal there was really uh, program building, right? How can you increase majors on the quick to survive? Essentially, the provost came in and said, if you don't have this number of majors, um, <laughs> essentially by the end of the year, then your program's going away, and we were at like this number of majors. So it was this goal of how do you really build a program immediately? 
Uh, and we were successful, I have to say. Um, I hear the program is, is now hit its end, but we held it off for a long time. Um, so a lot of the work I was doing there was working with student programs, staging public programs, you know, as you guys probably know, all sorts of ways of trying to show significance and show impact and try and make the case fundamentally to, to sort of turn into a tenure track position. Um, building off of this then, I got lucky again, uh, ended up as an assistant professor. I was the lonely, the lone, lonely uh, class assist in the history department at UMass Lowell. Uh, and I was there for about five years. Um, at UMass Lowell, and this is what really brought me over there, what sort of brought me out of Indiana, um, I was the director of this Hellenic Studies program, uh, which was a sort of new, new-ish research or outreach center. And there I was doing fundraising, uh, working directly with our development team, uh, trying to sort of raise money to sort of build an endowment so we could do what we wanted to do, uh, doing communications, managing a team of undergraduates around communications, all the strategic planning, uh, a lot of event planning, a lot of community building. Uh, Lowell has a tremendously important and really wonderful Greek community. Um, and so we were working to build relationships for the university out into the Greek community uh, and then international relationships, right, uh, which sounds very fancy, um, but this is essentially building study abroad programs and serving as the university's liaison to universities in Cyprus and Greece uh, to help build some of these connections and get some MO MOU signed. Um, I loved being in grad school. Uh, I loved being a professor. I loved the teaching and the research, um, but I found the profession of professoring to be uh, a little constraining. Uh, and so what I realized after, I don't know, a couple of years was that what I really cared about was actually that institution building. Uh, I'd been doing at Valparaiso in terms of programs and then at UMass in terms of building this Hellenic studies program. And I love the relationships and I love the outward facingness of it all. Uh, and I really love the, the sort of opportunities to talk about a lot of different things. Um, and so after about five years or so, uh, and actually about two years uh, worth saying of networking, I uh, ended up as a foundation relations officer at MIT. Uh, I was there for about two and a half years, doesn't quite show, but it's June to November. Uh, and then uh, just switched over now to leadership giving, uh, which is to say a major gifts job uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So it's been a sort of long ride uh, and I'm just at the start of stage two of stage two, um, but you know, a lot of fun. Um, so I think if you're looking at how this all works, uh, and how that leap can be made, you know, whether you're in grad school or after grad school, you know, fundamentally, and a lot of people have said this, and a lot more people will say it, it's about skills, not stuff, right? Um, in other words, it's not so much teaching classics or Latin or Greek or whatever it might be, as much as it is the stuff that goes, or the skills rather, that goes into doing that. Um, have you had Chris Caterine? You, you must have at some point. Yeah, yeah, you've had Chris, right? So one of the the examples Chris used when I talked to him was this idea of talking to multiple audiences, right? So at nine in the morning, you're teaching a, a Greek history class to a room of 250 undergraduates who don't really know where Greece is, right? I mean, it's all brand new to them, right? So you're re really working at a sort of baseline level to a broad audience. And then at five o'clock, you trot down the road and you're at a seminar uh, with uh, something or another professor of this and that at, at Princeton or Harvard or wherever it is, right? In other words, speaking at a very high level. And you do this sometimes within hours of each other, right? So it's that ability to speak to multiple audiences that matters, not so much the actual teaching, right, of language or of history or whatever it might be, uh, or the sort of giving of, of high level academic papers. It's more the skills that you go into performing that action and getting that output. Um, the second thing is really service roles. Um, these aren't necessarily, <laughs> depends on the institution, but it's that significant for faculty promotion. Um, you know, my directorship of this program at UMass didn't really count for anything to be, you know, to be perfectly honest. It was sort of 10%, I think, of my tenure portfolio. Um, and this is a challenge, right? And you have this in grad school. In grad school, I ran a workshop series. Uh, it was a way, frankly, of making a few extra bucks here and there. Um, but I loved it, right? I loved sort of putting together the program over the course of the year. I loved, you know, inviting the speakers, bringing them in, handling all the logistics of this, uh, laying out the wine, laying out the cheese, doing the event planning. Uh, and it's those things, right? that are actually gonna be crucial for the career transition, including and maybe even especially in the development. Um, and, you know, and so I was put in there speaking to non-academic audiences, um, which is to say, 
The stereotype, of course, is not really true, but it is a stereotype that you have to get around, which is to say, particularly for development officers who work with faculty, there's a sense that faculty and, and grad students really speak particularly at a very high level, right? Uh, get caught in the trees and can't see the forest. Um, and so it's this ability to sort of talk to the public that if you can build that kind of experiences really helps you use your academic experience to push outwards. So at Valpo, uh, I did a lot of public programs. I took a squeeze in front of a bunch of people one time, which is kind of an odd turn for me. I uh, gave a lot of public lectures, talked on just infinite numbers, it seems like, of church basements. Um, at UMass, right, I had meetings with donors, uh, handled communications. We had a, a Facebook, uh, which was totally useless, frankly, in terms of communications. Uh, think about your audience before you build a page. Um, did a lot of event planning, a lot of community building activities. Uh, we put on concerts. We uh, did poetry competitions. I was an institutional liaison. Uh, I talked to you know boards and, and directors and presidents every now and then of uh, Greek and Cypriot universities. And then uh, what I put on here is incipient, incipient board management, volunteer management. In other words, I was working with the Greek community to build something, right? And the key here for development is really this last bit. I don't know if you can actually see my arrow or not, um, which is to say it's building relationships, right? What you're doing is, is you're building relationships with people, building trust, building experience uh, to get to an ask, right? To get to the point where you're asking them to support you further. So the question then turns to, and I think this is hard sometimes for faculty, right? I mean, we all know uh, there are endowments. Uh, we know there are fundraisers, uh, people call you from your undergraduate institution, uh, you get direct mail, um, you know, but what is all of this stuff, right? And how does this work as an actual career? So at the highest level then, um, the top of all of the, the sort of, you think of development as a sort of pyramid uh, is university advancement, uh, which is to say, this is the office that is advancing the mission of the institution. And within advancement, generally speaking, though not always, sometimes the two are just combined, you'll have an alumni association and a development office. So what these are is really two sides of the same coin, right? Which is to say engaged alumni, engaged stakeholders are your donors of the future. So the Alumni Association um, largely serves to do alumni engagement, right? They're sending you news outreaches, they're staging reunions, they're doing all sorts of things to bring you in that don't necessarily have an ask component to it. It might be sort of in the background, um, but what they're really trying to do is keep you engaged and informed to help you feel like you're part of the community because you are, right? As alumni, you are part of this and we're making sure that this relationship continues uh, throughout your life. Then on the other side of that coin is the development office, which is really the fundraising wing. Uh, these are the people who make the asks particularly for money, have the gift conversations. And then on the flip side of this are stewarding those gifts so that donors know that their money is having the impact that they want it to have. So if you look then at development officers and what we do all day, you know, fundamentally this breaks down into four parts of what we call the donor cycle. So if you come in as a brand new gift officer, um, you are, I'm actually getting mine this afternoon uh, after this meeting, uh, you'll be given a portfolio of prospects, right? Potential donors is what a prospect is. And this is going to have a mix of people who have been giving at high levels for a long time, a mix of people who we think are interested, possible, might give money at high levels, uh, and people who you may never have met right, who may have been engaged in various ways by the Alumni Association, but haven't had a gift conversation. So your cycle as you're working through your portfolio is basically driving conversations through what's really a circle uh, and starts with qualification, right, where you go out and qualify prospects. So you have your list of, of alumni, you have your list of people who've expressed interest in the organization. Uh, and what you're going to do is go out there, identify them, figure out who they are, and spend some time understanding their philanthropic interests, right? Just because someone graduated from MIT, maybe all of their philanthropy goes to United Way or to their children's schools or to, you know, paying their bills, uh, putting it back into the business, right? So we're trying to identify people who are interested and have the capacity to give major gifts. If a person is qualified as a prospect, right, it seems like MIT or your institution falls within their philanthropic priorities, then you move into what's called cultivation, um, where what you're doing is basically serving as a human version of Match.com, uh, which may be a dated reference, but 
um, you know, is, is sort of this algorithm of matching up um, institutional priorities and needs to donor priorities in the areas where they want to have an impact, right? One of the, the tricks about development is that it's not really sales, right? In sales, you're selling a product. In, re, in development, what you're doing is really building relationships and helping people have the impact that they want to have. So what we're trying to do is really make sure that when someone is interested in behaving philanthropically and making philanthropic gifts, that we're presenting them with a ways to have the impact that they want to have with that gift within the institution that we work for. So what we're doing then is communicating with the prospect pool to keep people engaged, right? So this is what I put on here as being politely persistent, right? So if someone says no, what that means is, ask me again in three months, right? Ask me again in a year. And so what we're doing is, is sort of being very polite, but maintaining an insight into what they're interested in and where they wanna have an impact. This then can move into a gift conversation. Um, and this can take between a year, it can take three years. These can be very long-term conversations. But our role in these conversations is basically to, to be match.com, right? If a, if a philanthropist is interested in, in uh, student scholarships, right, to pair them up with the department head, to pair them up with the faculty member whose research they're interested in. Um, and we serve as an effectively a sort of project managers to keep gift conversations moving forward, asking the awkward conversations, uh, and then in the end, making the ask for a gift, right? Knowing when you effectively pull the trigger and someone is, is sort of waiting for someone to sort of put some numbers on the table and start thinking about action, right? So the goal here is, is to keep us from sort of talking endlessly, but rather make sure that these conversations are moving uh, to a point. And then on the flip side of this, once the gift comes in, gets processed, everybody's really happy, um, it becomes a process of stewardship, right? Stewarding gifts, keeping donors engaged and informed. In other words, making sure that these reports go out to donors, right? You gave $100,000 to student scholarships. These are the students you've supported. Here's the wonderful work they've been doing. Uh, and, you know, thank you again for all of your support. It's really made a really big difference. And it does, right? I mean, this is the thing. You can really, from the development side, see that impact really clearly. And so our goal is to help communicate that outward as much as we can with the goal, too, that donors who are really happy with the success of their first gift begin to loop around back into more gifts. So all of this then operates within an office in sort of three fundamental tiers, right? And again, think of a pyramid right? Where giving operates on, on three basic levels, right? At the base of the pyramid is what's generally known as the annual fund and annual giving. And again, generally speaking, all institutions are different, right? If you know one, you know one. Um, what you're doing is, is raising money for the annual budget. The budget includes an annual fund amount. Uh, this tends to be the biggest portion of giving and is absolutely critical. If the annual office doesn't hit its goal, the university is hitting a deficit you know, on one of its budget lines. So these are the people that are doing direct mail, making phone calls. And fundamentally, what it comes down to is a form of marketing, right? Doing audience segmentation for effectiveness, understanding which messages land where and how effective that can be. Um, this is an area that does a lot of reunions, uh, reunion giving, right? Your 20th, you know, uh, what do you call it? Reunion is coming up, right? Maybe this is a good time for a $20,000 gift or a $20 gift, right? Um, this does class giving, um, you know, think of those thermometers, the class of 2002 has given 50% of its goal, right? And keeping those things moving, uh, giving days, uh, although, you know, my office does this too, actually, right? Hitting these sort of markers. Um, I think one's coming up is that, uh, next week. Um, so get ready for more solicitations. Uh, and this is the most common place to start, right? If you were sort of 23 out of college interested in development, uh, the annual fund would be the place where you would, you would almost certainly go. Uh, if you're coming out of grad school, this is a really, really great place to go. You're going to see a lot. You're going to learn a lot about the institution. Um, and this is a sort of baseline. Annual fund experience is, is hugely important. Uh, the next tier, uh, and this is what I do, is uh, major gifts. Um, this depends on the institution, but fundamentally, at MIT, this is about $100,000 gifts and above. It, you know, maybe it's $50,000, maybe it's 10. But anyway, what you're doing is, is this is relationship building. And so major gift officers are fundraising fundamentally for three things, uh, for research at universities, at least, for students, student scholarships, uh, and for buildings, right, for capital. 
Uh, you can be raising endowed funds, right? In other words, you put in $100,000 and it turns out $4,000 a year, basically forever. Uh, or you can be uh, fundraising for expendable funds. In other words, you have $100,000 and it can be spent down, right? And what this is then is highly relationship-based, right? People don't give $100,000, sort of sit down and write you a check, right? Um, they don't send checks like that based on direct mail. I mean, some do, to tell you the truth, but it's, it's generally speaking uh, relationship-based. And so what you get to do in major gifts is really learn donors really, really closely and learn a lot about institutions and get to be that sort of liaison and get to be the sort of match.com. Uh, and then at the highest level is what's called uh, principal giving, uh, which are gifts, you know, sort of million dollars or so, $5 million or so and up. Uh, and this is basically the same set of principles as major gifts. Uh, it works a little differently, right? There's only going to be um, a limited pool of high net worth individuals or ultra high net worth individuals who give at those kind of levels. So the relationships sort of evolve a little bit differently. Uh, these guys tend to work a lot with the president or with the board, um, but same basic set of principles. So Fundamentally, what development in the frontline capacity is, is making asks, right? Asking people for money. And what I want to suggest to you is that you are doing this all the time. So, you know, since there's only really a handful of us, I think we can all just do this together, if that makes sense. Um, you know, what I want to do is just take a break. Uh, and maybe let's talk a little bit about a time when you ask somebody for support. Right. Um, and so, you know, the questions are these, right? What were you asking for? Right. Uh, were you asking for materials? Think of archaeologists, right? You're constantly asking people for access to things. Were you asking for funds? Were you putting in a grant request, a grant proposal? Uh, and then sort of three structures to this, right? How did you approach the relationship to get to the ask, right? How did you learn what you need to do in order to write a successful proposal? How did you learn about the sort of uh, minister of culture who you have to ask for access to the museum's collections? Um, you know, whatever it might be, you know, what strategy, how did you frame that ask? Uh, and then what did you do afterwards? So I'll just take a break uh, and, um, you know, we can take a minute to think and love to hear from you. I won't call on anybody because this isn't a class, but <laughs> those habits are still uh, firmly ingrained, I have to say. I mean, for me, and sorry if my, uh, if my audio breaks up, I'm sitting outside so I don't have great internet. Um, so apart from asking for letters of recommendation, um, I think the only thing that I can think of that I've asked for is when, so we recently got a grant from the university, I'm at Columbia, um, to uh, fund our, to, to fund two fellowships for our post -bac program for three years. Um, and so I was, I was the, I, I did the majority of the writing on our sort of quasi grant proposal. Um, that said, it was already within a very specific context. Uh -huh. um, of knowing that the money was there for somebody. Um, and it was just, you know, making the case that we were the ones that should get it for our particular um, pur purpose. Um, so like, I, that's sort of the, the extent of what I can think of for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really a great example, actually. And actually, I would also include asking for letters of support, right? Um, in order to, or letters of recommendation, right? I mean, I remember when I first started grad school, I was applying for a fellowship uh, and I didn't know <laughs> really any of the faculty, right? It's your first month or two. Uh, and, and what you have to do to get to that point is build a relationship, right? So I was in a seminar and I had to make a point of going to office hours and really building up those relationships there, uh, making sure that the faculty member that I wanted to write that letter knew what I was doing uh, and then asking, right? Can you write something? You're asking for time, but asking for time is an ask, right? It's a resource. So I would include that too. Um, and then in terms of the sort of, I think you sort of called it a quasi grant proposal. That's actually basically what you do in foundation relations, uh, which is where I started uh, and which is a great place for uh, academics. Uh, in fact, if you look at Columbia, the head of Columbia's foundation relations has a PhD. Uh, she's, she's Greek. In fact, I've met her a couple of times. Um, and 
the issue there is this foundations pay out 5% a year of their resources by law. That's how they're a foundation. Um, and so the money's there, right? It's a matter of making the case that you're the person it should go to. So I think that's actually a really good example. Uh, and the fact that you've done the writing, um, you know, that's really putting together the solicitation. Um, that's a large part, well, a, a decent part of what foundation relations officers do. So yeah, I think that's actually, both of those are really great examples. Any others? No pressure either. We can <laughs> plug along and get to questions sooner too. Because my internet is going, it's fluctuating. Oh yeah. Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, the, um, I'm at SLU, St. Louis University which is trying to eliminate its, its classics program. And mm -hmm. um, I've been, I'm the only full-time member and I've been holding on by a thread and teaching double just to keep Greek and Latin going. Yeah. Um, and I have multiple times tried to go ahead and um, uh, host events and have uh, uh, like guest speakers and all sorts of activities to raise our profile among upper administration. Yeah. And I've been shut down um, every time. And our, our uh, program does have money to spend, but it's a matter of raising the profile and mm -hmm. uh, the upper administration will sign the checks. So uh, my hands are tied. Yeah. Uh, and um, do you have any suggestions for maybe external funding that, that goes around the university's administration? And um, they've developed a huge organization um, at the top end of the university that is in control of all research. So it's very difficult. It's a it's a whole kind of center with like, I don't know, eight full time employees, administrators. Oh, so it's sort of, really yeah, difficult sure. to do anything because yeah. anything I apply for, they shut down. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I'm really sorry to hear that. It's uh, it's an unfortunately common story. Um, you know, this was really the challenge of Valparaiso. And I think that program actually got shuttered this this last year. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the challenge, I think, and so I'm in a department now, um, but I have only been for three days, um, is, is really showing that level of support. You know, I know UIC, uh, Eric, you may even remember this, um, you know, for a while was under this same sort of siege, uh, and was really successful in building, you know, sort of petitions and, and sort of impact statements from students and this kind of thing. You know, I mean, as far as getting funding, the challenge for access to donors is that you have to go through development, um, which is by design, which is to say, development officers serve the needs of the institution. We don't set the priorities. Uh, in a way, this is a downside, you know, for me, and as much as I, you know, I have ideas, this would be great to do that, that'd be great. Or some of these ideas are terrible. Maybe we should do some other ones. Whereas, you know, my job as a development officer is to basically get my brief and go forth and, and find funds and find interested uh, prospects. And so, to that end, you know, I think the key as far as fundraising in your situation would be essentially to build relationships with, um, I mean, there's there's going to be a vice president of development or various people within that tier. Uh, I'd warn that'll be hard to do because they're taking their brief from, you know, the president's office and the provost's office. Uh, development can be a very structured organization. Um, so it's, it's sometimes hard to work around these things. Um, you know, I'll say research administration services are uh challenging offices uh for everybody you know at umass uh we had a similar kind of structure um it was sort of hard to interact with um yeah i don't know i mean funding in the humanities is really hard um you know i think what i would suggest is is trying to work with the alumni association which st louis you know will surely have uh and and try and build relationships with department alumni um and sort of department friends right you know if you could get a list of people maybe who took a class uh, and then try and find ways to build relationships with them, uh, because what you're doing is, is you build up that base of support that can help make the case upwards to administration. Uh, I would just warn that, you know, the RD, the Resource Development Alumni Association side takes their cues from the president, right, and the provost's office. So, you know, in a sense, their priorities may be set, um, but it's always possible to sort of, you know, 
try a, a ground up approach as well. Um, but no, I'm really sorry to hear that. I wish it wasn't such a unfortunately mm -hmm. common uh, story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not alone. I know that. Yeah, no, I'm sure. Yeah, but good luck. <laughs> oh, thank you. You have some great all, all people. Because I mean, flu are really, really hurting because they've yeah. just you know, eliminated languages from mm -hmm. any requirement. So mm -hmm. it's all the languages are like shuffling around trying to find ways to survive. Yeah. Not just Latin and Greek. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, you know, Darcy's point here at uh, that must be Washington University, right? Uh, Washio and Mizu uh, could be useful allies. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they are. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was really useful in the Chicago instance as well. I know the Chicago faculty, I think the Northwestern sort of pitched in on that effort too. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to hear it's a struggle. Yeah. I don't know, Eric, Rebecca, any, any thoughts? Or we can just move on and, and get to questions at the end just as well. All right, well, we'll plug ahead. So, um, oh, my thing is behaving weird. There it goes. Um, so one of the other beauties, I would argue, of development is that while I have enjoyed being a frontline fundraiser and there are a lot of frontline fundraisers, there is actually something for everyone in development. Um, in other words, it's actually a very complex enterprise, uh, which is, is why it takes its cues from the top, right? Is because, you know, the resource development's budget is gonna come from the administration. So the administration wants to see that that money is spent uh, wisely, right? In the way that they want hitting institutional priorities. So at the sort of, I won't say top of the heap, but sort of the, the front line of the sort of organization is going to be these frontline fundraisers. So these can be in the annual fund. Uh, at MIT, there's the annual fund. It's actually housed within the Alumni Association. Uh, there's what we call the Office of Leadership Giving, uh, which is major gifts. Uh, there's leadership giving officers in central development, right, who cultivate prospects for the entire institute. And then there are people like me based in departments and schools, right? The School of Humanities, Arts, Social Sciences has two officers. Uh, School of Engineering has a dean of fundraising. And then there are each department more or less anyways has a giving officer. Uh, and then there's also uh, what we call the Office of Philanthropic Partnerships, uh, which includes international giving. Uh, and this is principal giving at the top. So there's lots of different ways to do frontline fundraising. Um, if you prefer a more structured approach, uh, or if you are a, I don't know, let's say recovering academic uh, like myself, um, a really great place to go is uh, foundation uh, foundation relations, right? Foundations or institutional giving. Um, this field tends to be called, I'm on the wrong screen, uh, corporate and foundation relations. Um, so in other words, what you're doing is, is you're working with institutions rather than individuals. Um, and what makes this such a great place for PhDs, right? If you take a look at the Ivy Plus institutions and their CFR offices, the numbers of PhDs, it's like probably 70% or so. Um, and if not that high, pretty close. Uh, is that you need to be very, very up on academic research across a number of different academic fields and able to communicate with foundation program officers who are in many cases academics as well. In other words, you actually need to be able to speak academic and do so pretty fluently. Um, in my last job, I worked with economics, with political science, with the arts. Um, you know, I'd have a morning meeting with a, a foundation about social sciences and political science and big data. Uh, and then in the afternoon, I'd, I'd literally hop in a cab, go down uh, Madison Avenue and go to another foundation and talk about contemporary art. Uh, so it's that ability to really pivot and operate at a pretty high academic content level uh, that makes foundations really good. It's also a field in which you probably have experience. I think, Darcy, you were saying you, you had done a, a sort of grant proposal before. That's basically the way that foundations work, right? Uh, which is to say, you're working to understand the foundation's priorities and then make the faculty member's proposal hit as many of those notes as possible. So it's a bit more of a structured place, um, but it's a really great place for academics. It's a good entry point. It'd be a good place as a, a career. Uh, I may actually at some point go back to foundation relations. Uh, really great spot for academics. Um, if you think more of not so much the back end per se, but there are lots of different other aspects to the way that all of these offices work. Um, there is communication and events. Uh, if you're a writer, um, we have writers there. Uh, writers write press releases. They uh, write, you know, there's a lot of ghost writing that goes on in development. Um, the president has a ghost writer for development that writes letters 
uh, for him. Uh, almost every university will have a lot of writers, uh, a lot of communications officers, and an event planning. Um, you know, if, if what you really love doing, and I actually would say I was one of these people, is putting on lectures, putting on events, uh, thinking of these logistics, right? There's an entire team that puts these events on. Uh, donor relations and stewardship, right, is on the other side. Uh, donor relations um, puts together a lot of these reports, is tracking the impact of gifts and channeling, oftentimes working with communications to put these out to donors and to the wider community. Uh, gift planning uh, is largely thinking about bequests, uh, thinking about people who want to put MIT in their wills um, or, you know, whatever institution. Um, St. Louis uh, in their wills, right? And this is a slightly different thing. This becomes almost more of a financial advisor kind of role. There are all sorts of, frankly, fascinating vehicles uh, by which you can leave a bequest to an institution and the gift planning people are really the experts in that. And then um, also a good one, um, if you, you know, sort of don't envy talking to donors and sort of being out front, um, there are teams of prospect development, uh, which is to say prospect research, uh, researching donors, researching institutions, staying up to date on the news, um, identifying, um, you know, new prospects, uh, keeping your eyes out for people who are having sort of liquidity events and sort of making sure that they're on the gift officer's radar, uh, helping write briefs, all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, so if research is your thing, uh, that's another good place to be. And development is, is, you know, an office where we have, you know, maybe not hundreds, but tens certainly of researchers working around the institution. In fact, maybe hundreds across MIT uh, to pull together this kind of information. So, why then fundraising for classics uh, and for classicists? Um, I think that the top line is, is really the key for me. Um, when I was looking at a career change, what I realized was as much as I wish I loved banking, uh, what I really love doing is building institutions. I love universities. I love higher education. And what I cared about was how do you build a sustainable institution? Uh, and fundraising is a way that this happens, right? Endowments are what creates that stability. Um, and so this is an area where you can really contribute to this. Uh, you know, I put on here, you know, I love research. If you love nonprofits, uh, if you're interested in the social sector uh, or in libraries or art museums or orchestras or really any form of nonprofit in youth training programs, there's a really wonderful one in Lowell. Um, in, you know, really you name it. I have a friend who's a foundation relations uh, officer for um, guide dogs. Right. So you can do all sorts of things and really contribute to causes you care about, you know, students, cultural institutions, hospitals, another great place. And fundamentally, and this is the weird part about it, you are paid to like things that you like publicly. Right. Um, when you care about an institution, what you are paid to do as a development officer is help other people care about it in the way that you do. The other thing uh, key for classicists, I think, uh, is that it's ubiquitous. Uh, fundraisers are everywhere. And here's these numbers actually, you know, about 12% growth. I think I might've gotten it wrong before. Uh, even as 50% of fundraisers are thinking about leaving in the next five years. And this was pre-pandemic, um, which is to say lots of jobs, not so many people. Um, recruiters will come calling very, very quickly. Um, it's also great for career changers. There's not like a career track in development, right? This isn't like being a lawyer at a big firm where you come in as an associate, then you're a senior associate, then you're a partner, then you're a, you know, whatever. Um, you can really enter at any point in development. Uh, you need to be able to persuade a manager, a hiring manager, that you have the skills that they're looking for. But it's a field that is very, very, very used to career changers. Um, go to LinkedIn and find some fundraisers. Go to your university's uh, link, you know, university development site. You will find just a huge volume, 50% more are people who have had a career in a different field before fundraising. And then lastly, you get to use your classical education. Um, not so much the Greek or Latin, um, exactly, but the communications, the strategic thinking, uh, how to put together a project, um, right? What is project management? How do you build out a research agenda? Um, how do you understand nuance in highly ambiguous situations and relationships? Um, the way I used to describe ancient history to students was, you know, and this is, I stole this from somebody else, um, building a jigsaw puzzle where you only have a third of the pieces or less, you don't have any idea what percentage of pieces you have and you don't know the picture in the box really is, right? So this is in some sense what we're doing in development, which is to say understanding human humans, 
and their priorities and where they want to have an impact on the world and operating within these ambiguous situations where people say things like, yeah, I'm interested in that. Get back to me. With what? When? Right. And operating within this space and finding a good strategy to keep conversations moving forward. You know, I think it's something classicists do all the time, um, sometimes, you know, in conversation with their administrations about programs uh, and keeping them going. So it's a it's a really good place to use a lot of the skills that at least I thought I built, you know, as a classics PhD and then faculty member on the other side. So if we think about transferable skills, I just sort of want to make this as plain as possible, right? This is an ad from Mass General, a hospital. Uh, I think this was for foundation relations. So you can get a sense of the sort of breadth and openness of what people are looking for, right? Looking for collegial, entrepreneurial team player, right? Um, you know, classicists, small departments, you have to get along. Um, you know, at, at Valpo with two people, we were in foreign languages, um, you know, you had to be able to talk to German professors, to professors of Chinese, to the history department, to the English department, to anthropology. I think there were two of them too, um, right? In other words, building relationships, being collegial, getting along with people. Entrepreneurial is really the same sort of thing. Uh, track record of professional growth, successful relationship manager in a complex organization. Operating in a university is complex, you know, as a graduate student in particular, understanding places like Columbia, um, you know, they're just incredibly sort of Byzantine structures in so many ways. Uh, relationship management, you know, you're working with your advisor, you're working with your peers. If you work on an excavation, you're working with workers, with the director, with the trench supervisor, with all these sorts of people and thinking about ways to describe these relationships in not transactional terms, but in relationship development terms. And so what we're thinking for is a strategic thinker, excellent writing, communication skills, ability to engage, influence, and motivate others, which is teaching, right? In other words, all of these things can have this sort of slight twist around the things we're doing, right? So if you break it down, we're formulating strategy, following targets, watching moves, right? Uh, moving people through that donor cycle is, is, is called moves management and documenting your work, right? You're collaborating with people and then understanding the breadth of work at MGH, right? As a classicist, as a PhD, what you have is a degree in learning a lot of stuff, right? So you will be able to go into a hospital. You're not gonna be a doctor, you won't become a surgeon, but you can understand the impact of what surgeons and doctors are talking about when they're talking about changing slight programs within ER procedures to improve patient experience, right? You, can, you have the tools to understand these things in a way that people you know, from different backgrounds you know, may be less adept at. Uh, and you've proven it by learning Greek and Latin, by writing on, you know, Homer or Pindar or Virgil, you know, God forbid, um, you know, whatever it might be. So, you know, all of these, I think, are really transferable skills. And the trick is being able to translate between what we do as classicists and what development officers do in these job descriptions. So how to make the move. Um, Step one is really networking. Uh, you know, I said at the beginning when I decided I wanted to move, um, you know, the first thing I did was call basically anyone who was standing still. Um, the first person I talked to was a colleague, my wife's colleague's husband was a development officer. It turns out when I was in Chicago, all of the other parents at daycare were development officers. I had no idea at the time, but you start poking around, right? Call them up. Um, have one of these sort of informational interviews. It feels very sort of, you know, awkward, right? And very formal. But in fact, all you're doing is, is you're learning the field, you're learning the language of the field, and you're learning institutions, right? If you really want to work at Tufts, call people at Tufts, right? Understand the ways that their offices work, uh, the ways that their institutions work. And what you're doing is, is not transactional, right? You're asking for advice. You're asking for background. You're asking people to talk about themselves, which, you know, clearly people like doing. Right. So this is a conversation that people are very, very ready to have, very, very willing to have. And what you're doing is learning. Right. You're gathering information and you're putting it into a new language. Right. It's not Greek or Latin. Right. It's development. The you know, sort of the other tip I have here is, is basically make the calls. Right. Go out and do it. Um, the tendency with these things is it's such a fuzzy thing. Like I need to talk to people is too broad. Uh, so what really helped me was actually setting metrics, um, which is a huge function of development, um, which is to say, I think I said, I'm gonna call five people a week, right? A call a day. 
Sometimes I wouldn't hit it. Sometimes I would get seven. Sometimes I would get 10, not much more, um, right? In other words, if you set a goal, people work to goals, it'll help you get out and do it and get over the hump. And the other thing, if you're interested in development is this is what development is, right? Making the calls, having these conversations, learning where people are. So if you think of networking also as, as building that skill set and also practicing that skill set, it can help get over that hump a little bit. Um, secondly, you know, thinking about it is to think through your transferable skills, right? How do your war stories convert to development? Um, you know, Darcy, you've applied for grants. You'll apply for more grants as a grad student. You know, there's a lot of applying for money that goes on, um, right? All of these things are transferable skills that you can take into this kind of situation, right? When have you built relationships, asked for support, built engagement around an issue or an institution? Um, this could be political. Uh, you could do this at, say, a church or a temple or, or wherever, you know, um, this could be building, right? You're starting a new seminar series, right? How did you get that off the ground? Um, you know, any range of examples. Um, you know, the best example I heard was a, a historian become development officer where his archives were basically people's family archives. So what he did was he flew to France and he spent a year meeting French families in this very sort of categories and building relationships so that in the long run, he could ask for access to their, you know, relatives papers and documents and various things like that. So it's this, it's not development, not asking for money, but asking for access, right? All of these things are relationships building towards a request. Uh, and then the last thing is to volunteer, right? Everybody needs help. Nonprofits desperately need help. Uh, at least in New England, um, each town has its own ed foundation. Uh, hop on those boards. People are desperate uh, for more hands and all of those things, right? Even if what you're really doing is stuffing envelopes or sort of drafting up that direct mail that goes out, you know, please give, you know, a hundred dollars this year, help the schools, you know, build uh, student programs. The robotics club needs a new robot. Um, all of these things are asks and all of these things will build experience while you're helping programs that you care about already. Um, so basically it's experience for free. Uh, and then the last thing I point out, uh, and then we can sort of just chit chat, is uh, organizations to take a look at uh, if you're really interested. Uh, highest level is CASE. Um, this is education uh, development. This is the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. This is national. It's the biggest. Um, it's a huge resource. It's an enormous website. It is education only, but if you say went to a prep school, one of these sort of boarding schools, um, boarding schools are included there. Secondary schools are included there. Um, charter schools. I met a lot of charter school development people. Uh, at conferences. Um, really wonderful thing. Conferences tend to be kind of expensive, um, but if you can find a way either to get somebody else to support your going or can just sort of swing it, you know, it's a great way to network. Uh, really useful. Second one is AFP. Uh, I've put here AFP Mass because I'm in Massachusetts. Uh, I believe more or less each state, certainly each region, will have an AFP chapter. Uh, this is a little closer to the ground. It's less costly, broader. Uh, in other words, this is where nonprofits, cultural institutions, um, you know, service, social service kind of institutions are going to advertise. Um, at least in Massachusetts, they have job listings for free. Uh, and the last one is really an extraordinary group here, uh, Women in Development. And I've given you the Boston chapter here. I suspect there are, you know, there must be ones everywhere else. There's definitely one in New York. Um, this is a great organization. Um, you know, it's women in development, but they're, they're very broad. Uh, and so they were helpful for me, just a lot of information, good networking. Uh, they do events uh, specifically around sort of helping build careers. Um, more people you know, the easier this gets. Uh, you learn the language, you learn the field, uh, and then people can help you uh, and people will help you. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is if you're at a university, um, call your development office, uh, your development team almost, I'd be shocked. I mean, shocked to death if they didn't take the call. If you don't know who else to call, call them and ask about the job, right? Ask about the institution, ask how they operate. Um, and then ask them to help you. Uh, development officers I have found will always take the call and will always help. So, you know, do feel free to reach out to me. Uh, here's my email, find me on LinkedIn uh, or call your own office. In fact, and call your own office. Uh, it's a great career, it's growing. It's a way to have impact, to make the world a better place, to make your institution a better place uh, in a way that you guys have all of the skills to do already. So yeah, thanks and uh, happy to take in any questions.